the one thing that most people think about when they think about meteorology, when they think about weather, when they think about um, this whole field, and that's forecasting. And so um, today I'm going to answer the age old question, why do we always get it wrong? And hopefully you'll find a few really interesting things here. And, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the steps involved in weather forecasting, some of the things that can go wrong, and why even in this world of technological revolution, weather forecasting will always involve a human component. So with that said, let's jump in. So the first thing we're gonna talk about are the steps to making a weather forecast. And then the next lecture we're gonna talk about the human involvement. So first off, believe it or not, weather forecasting is in a very real sense predicting the future. So if you think about a genie over a crystal ball and looking into it and figuring out how the future is going to look like, that is in a very real sense what weather forecasting is. We are looking into a crystal ball and predicting the future. And there's always jokes that I like to tell people about this. Um, the, uh, the meteorologist, the on-air meteorologist on, on TV actually has the hardest job because everybody else on there is reading about stuff that's already happened, whereas the meteorologist is trying to predict the future. The good news is we have a few aces up our sleeves. We actually have a few tools. And so let's talk about what's actually in that crystal ball the thing that we are looking at when we make weather forecasts. So here are the steps to making weather forecasts. The first thing we need to do, similarly to what any doctor does when they look at a patient, is we need to make a diagnosis. We need to look at the current situation, what is currently happening. And in order to do that, we need to collect, we need to analyze, we need to read, we need to interpret, weather data, current weather data, what's happening right now. And then we make a prognosis. And the prognosis, I'm sure if you've ever gotten a doc diagnosis from a doctor or um, anybody, there's, there's different layers to the prognosis. Um, for a meteorologist, these layers include weather models, which are computerized simulations of the atmosphere. Then humans take those, the, the, the results from those computer models and statistically analyze them to look at what the most likely outcome is, um, how likely is that outcome, what, what the confidence level in the forecast is. They use tools such as what are called ensembles and model output statistics to do that. And then once you get all of that, you then have to use human instinct to interpret the model solution. And, and I'll explain why in a little bit. And that's actually gonna be more in the next lecture. So for this lecture, we're gonna talk about steps one through three. The next lecture, we're gonna talk about step four. So first, let's talk about collecting weather data. So in order for us to accurately even make a weather forecast, we need an accurate picture of the current situation. And in order to do that, we need to go out and we need to observe. We need to measure, we need to, um, we need to analyze, we need to look at what is currently happening. And the good news is even as we speak, as I'm recording this video and as you're watching it, I guarantee you there are thousands of weather stations all around the world doing this. Not only that, but above us, there are satellites floating over our head right now doing this all across the world. So this is actually happening instantaneous right now as we speak. Not only that, but then every few hours, trained meteorologists go out and they take additional readings using things such as weather balloons, using things such as, um, such as their own vision, also looking at things like visibility and, and so on. And, and then they're also calibrating these instruments. So there's a lot of weather data being collected right at this moment. And we need to know what to do with that weather data and we need to be able to analyze that weather data. The good news is there's a lot of products and a lot of places that we can go 
to access and analyze weather data. Um, and even you as an armchair meteorologist or, or meteorologist in training can do this. There's, a, there's many sources on the World Wide Web that you can use to access weather data. Um, the National Weather Service is a top organization. Um, for more international data, you can look at the World Meteorological Organization. This is the international weather body, the international governing head honchos of meteorology for the whole world. And there's also a cool project that we've looked at a few times this quarter called MesoWest. And MesoWest allows you to not just look at current conditions, but to also go back and look at archives of previous conditions. So you can find out what was happening in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico on July 4th, 1993, if you want to. Um, I actually don't know if the weather station at Truth or Consequences is actually on MesoWest or how long it's been on, but take a look and see what you can find. And many of these data clearing houses on MesoWest go back 20, 30, 40 years. So there's a lot of weather data available at your fingertips. Now with that said, Sometimes we're going to have information overload. And so there are also tools that we have at our fingertips to not just view the raw numbers, but to also plot and interpret these raw numbers. And many of these tools are available on a system called the Advanced Weather Interactive Processing System, also known as AWIPS. AWIPS, so kind of like whips and chains, um, AWIPS. And this allows meteorologists to organize and utilize all of that data. The other thing that these, um, these AWIP systems allow, they also allow meteorologists to then look at forecasts and analyze each of those forecasts. And that becomes an important step later on. Another cool tool that I like to use is what's called a meteogram. And this was a meteogram that I took. This was um, about a year, year and a half ago. I'm recording this in 2018 um, from San Jose International Airport. And on this meteogram, you have several different panels and each panel is showing something different. Um, this top panel shows a 24 hour cycle of air temperature and dew point temperature. That can then give you a sense of how saturated the air was. Um, down here, any weather conditions, any rainfall, visibility, um, wind, wind uh, speed, wind direction, cloud cover, all of these things tell us what we need to know about sky conditions. This third panel is showing us um, ceiling height, so how high is the base of our clouds, and then this last panel is showing us air pressure. And so each one of these things is designed to give you a snapshot as to how weather conditions have changed over a 24 hour time period. And this is just one meteogram. Um, if you're interested in studying more meteograms, come check out my weather and climate lab um, where we actually look at these a little bit more in depth. Another thing that we look in depth is the upper atmosphere um, because we don't just care about what's happening at the surface. Um, Weather conditions in the upper atmosphere have major implications on surface weather. Um, if there's divergence aloft, that creates low pressure at the surface. Um, another example would be rising air. If air is rising, that could be it. That could trigger instability, and then that instability can then cause the development of severe thunderstorms. Um, au contraire, on the other side, if the air is stable then pollution can be trapped near the surface. We need to know these things. And so one of the tools we have available to us are what are called soundings. So basically every 12 hours, so at 12Z, which is um, 12 p.m. over in Greenwich, England, and at 24Z or 0Z, um, which is midnight in Greenwich, England, Meteorologists from all around the world go outside and they launch weather balloons. And these weather balloons then collect data, including things such as temperature, which is found on the right side of this diagram, dew point temperature, which is found on the left, wind direction and wind speed, 
and a litany of other weather variables, such as the presence of any cape um, or, or sin, so that's convective inhibition and convective available potential energy. Um, if you're in my online class, we talked about that back in module four, when we talked about stability. Um, and this can also help us identify any sort of advection patterns based on how the winds are shifting with height. So there's a lot that we can see here. With that said, once we've collected all this weather data, once we've looked at it, once we have a very good picture of what's currently happening, we then take all of this data and we plug it into a forecast model. Now, what is a forecast model? So, if you remember a few modules ago when we talked about the two column model of air pressure, and then in the following mod module, we talked about the three cell model of atmospheric circulation. Um, a model is simply a simplification of something. Basically, you're taking something that is big and, and impossible to experiment with, and you're whittling it down to something that you can work with. Well, believe it or not, our atmosphere can actually be summed up in a set of equations called the governing equations. And each one of those equations determine things such as advection, um, rising and sinking air, um, conservation of mass. Uh, there, there's a lot of things, a lot of the different physical and chemical properties of the atmosphere are governed via these equations. And we can then plug current weather data into these equations to then make a prediction for a later time. And that prediction is a solution to that set of equations, and we call that prediction a forecast. So we take all of our current data, we plug it into these equations, and out comes a forecast. With that said, suppose we did this for one large area. Suppose we did one forecast for the entire United States of America. That forecast would not be very representative of the diverse number of climates and microclimates we have here in the United States. And so it would be a pretty useless forecast. However, if these models were to instead split the United States or split the Earth up into infinitesimally small, I'm talking one centimeter by one centimeter pixels, and then had to run these equations for each one of those pixels, that would also be something that is very difficult and it would take a very long time to do. So we have to compromise a little bit. And so here's the way we do that. We split the Earth's surface and each layer that we're interested in in the atmosphere into a grid. And then we forecast for each cell in that grid. And I'll show you how this looks in a moment. Now the problem with forecasting models or weather forecast models is that they are simplified, imperfect representations of the atmosphere. What that means is that they can't take every single thing into account and they can't do a forecast for one point location um, in, in one, one infinitesimally small location. They can't do that. And so as a result, there's always going to be some error in these forecasts. That is one of the reasons why you will never see a perfect forecast. But the good news is we are able to, over time, learn from our errors, learn from our mistakes, better our models, and improve them. So here's an image of how a forecasting model works. So down here we have the eastern United States, and we take this whole region and we split it up into a grid with a series of grid boxes. What happens then is the forecast model then makes a prediction for weather conditions, so temperature, dew point, relative humidity, cloud cover, precipitation, and so on, for each of these grid boxes. Each of these grid boxes. And it makes a forecast for each one of them. Complicating this, as meteorologists, we don't just care about what's happening at the surface, we also want to know what's happening in other layers of the atmosphere, other elevations. 
So not only are we doing this kind of forecasting at the surface, but we're also doing it for different layers in the atmosphere. And I'll actually go into detail in a few minutes what layers we're looking at. So the way that this whole process works is we take our current weather data, we plug it into those equations, and then we, we say, okay, now make a prediction for a short time out. So we plug in those initial conditions, that current weather, we plug it in, and then we tell the model, okay, make a prediction for five minutes out. That prediction then comes out. Okay, that prediction is probably pretty accurate. In fact, I would say it's probably 99.9% .9 accurate. Why? Because chances are not a lot's going to change between now and five minutes from now. Things can change, but they're not going to change drastically. We then take that, though, those results, that forecast, and we feed it back into the model. And then that makes a forecast for 10 minutes out. Then we feed it back in 15 minutes out, feed it back in 20 minutes out, feed it back in 30, 25 minutes out, then 30 minutes out and so on and so forth until we have a forecast for our desired time. So this process takes a really long time. That does actually create a little bit of a dilemma for us. So it takes a long time to do this. And remember, we're not just doing this for one location. We're doing this for a whole grid of locations and at different layers in the atmosphere. So the more grid boxes there are, the more grid boxes there are, the longer the model takes to make this forecast. That then creates a dilemma. And this dilemma is discussed, or this dilemma is revealed when talking about the resolution of a forecast. So think about this. Let's say we had a forecast model and it split the earth up into 50 mile by 50 mile grid boxes. Right now I'm recording this lecture in Cupertino, California. 50 miles to my north is San Francisco. 50 miles to my south is Monterey. 50 miles to my east is Stockton. 50 miles to my west is out in the middle of the Pacific, well not the middle, but out into the Pacific Ocean. I can tell you right now for a fact weather conditions here in Cupertino are different than they are in San Francisco, in Monterey, in Stockton, and out over the Pacific Ocean. They're just different. So splitting the earth up into that large of a grid box isn't going to give you the most accurate forecast. However, the smaller the grid boxes are, the longer it takes to make the forecast. The more computational power is used, the more expensive this whole process becomes, both financially and computationally. It's a big deal. And so um, we have a dilemma. We want to create a forecast that is as accurate as possible, but that's also convenient in a sense of if we can get it done quickly enough. There are actually some of the original weather forecasts took 24 hours to make and so you were making a forecast for tomorrow and it wasn't finished until tomorrow then it's no good to anybody so we want to have forecasts that we can get together really quickly and so different models handle this issue differently and i'll actually show a few models in the next lecture but one of the things that you'll notice is that some models have very high resolution and so you get very fine details and you can see all the intricate differences. On the other hand, low resolution models give you a much more pixelated image, an image that looks more blocky and, and may actually blur some things out, but they're easy to do. Here's an example or just a, a difference between a low resolution and a high resolution. Um, I have two pictures of Mona Lisa here. In this image over here, Mona Lisa is split up into all these different grid boxes and one color is assigned for each of those grid boxes. Now, this right here has a relatively small enough amount of data. I mean, if you were bored and you didn't want to listen to my lecture, you could probably count the number of boxes in here 
and what colors they are, and you could probably upload and transmit this very easily, no problem. But again, it's not a very nice picture. I don't think anybody would be trying to protect this picture. On the other hand, here on the right, this is a high resolution graphic of Mona Lisa. And in this case, now we have very, very fine details. So now we have trillions and trillions of tiny little pixels, just like you see on your computer screen. Um, but every one of those pixels needs to be assigned a color. So now we have a lot more information. It takes as much data for to assign a color to one pixel on here as it does over here. So that's a lot more data, a lot more information. It's a lot more accurate, but it's also a lot more expensive computationally. And of course, this has a lot more value to it. Now with all that said, once, once you run it through the model and you look at like the different um, resolutions and, and different layers, you want to be able to analyze the results. You want to be able to take a look at these results, plot them on graphics, and see what's happening. And I actually have a, a few images I'll show in a moment. But um, first off, when we're looking at a weather forecast and we're analyzing the results, we don't just want to look at the surface. We also want to look at different layers above the surface. And on here, I have five different layers that we really care about. The first layer is the one that we're most familiar with, the surface. What's happening, what's happening here near the ground? And so here we care about all the different conditions that matter to us, such as temperature, humidity, wind speed, wind direction, cloud cover, precipitation, all the things that affect what we wear, how we're able to grow food, and all that stuff. So we care about all of that here at the surface. But as we begin to rise in the atmosphere, there's only a few things we care about in each layer. And just a reminder, um, we don't look at different heights. Instead, we look at different pressure levels. And the reason why is because um, different pressure levels have different distinct weather features to, to them. For example, the 850 millibar level, so this is the height at which air pressure is 850 millibars. Here, we're looking at moisture, temperature, um, the presence of what's called a low-level jet. Um, and these things actually greatly influence what's happening at the surface. So is there moisture being blown in via the low-level jet, or is there warm air being pushed in? What happens here is a quick indication of what could be happening at the surface tomorrow. Then at the 700 millibar level, so now we are at the 700 millibar level, and 700 millibars is approximately 10,000 feet. Um, it depends, again, it varies from location to location, but this is somewhere between 3,000, or sorry, yeah, 3,000 and 4,000, 2,000 and 3,000 meters. Um, here we look at advection. So advection is mass movement of air. Advection is mass movement of air. And we look at, is there a cold air mass coming in or is there a warm air mass coming in? Um, is there moisture coming in? What kind of moisture is coming in? That's what we're looking at at the 700 millibar level. Then at the 500 millibar level, we start to look more at large scale patterns, such as the presence of ridges or troughs in the jet stream. And we know from previous modules that ridges and troughs can greatly influence the temperature at the surface. If you're under a ridge, usually that means you have warm air at the surface. If you're under a trough, that usually means cold air at the surface. We also look at the spin of the air. It's what's called vorticity. And that's a little beyond the scope of this class, but vorticity greatly influences the ability for air to rise or sink in the atmosphere. And then finally, at the 300 millibar level, we look at the jet stream. And as I've said in a previous module, the jet stream acts like the freeway, or it acts like a freeway for weather systems to travel on. Um, another analogy I like to use is think about a, a river 
and if you throw a baseball in that river, um, basically that baseball is going to travel in the same direction as the river. Well, storms travel in the same direction as the jet stream. So here are each of these heights, um, each of these different layers. So we have 850 millibars, 700 millibars, 500 millibars, and 300 millibars. And our forecast model makes predictions at each of those levels, predicting wind speed, wind direction, um, how high the layer is going to be, temperature, all the different things, and it gives them to us in a series of progs. And a prog is just the, the abbreviation for prognosis. So a prog is a prognosis for the weather. And a 24-hour prog is simply a 24-hour prediction from now. So what's happening 24 hours from now? And so what we're seeing here are 24-hour progs for the 850 millibar level, 700 millibar level, 500 millibar level, and 300 millibar level. As I mentioned, every model is different. Um, or as I mentioned about this, um, different models have different strengths and weaknesses. And each model has a different resolution. Each model has a different set of equations and also how those equations are used. Each model has a different set of assumptions and approximations. And each model has a different strength or weakness. Here in the United States, there are three main weather models that we use. The North American model, the global forecasting system, and the European model, also known as the ECMWF. And these three models each have different things that they focus on, and they each make different predictions. And then as meteorologists, we have to look at those predictions to then develop a forecast. What's actually really cool though, is that if you are interested in looking at the different aspects of each of these models or looking at their output, you can actually do that. There's a cool website that a student of mine brought to me a, a, few, a few quarters ago, and I thought I'd show it to you. It's this website right here. It's called windy.com. And basically what it shows you is it shows you model output for the surface of the earth and it shows you a few different things and you can actually toggle between different things. What you're seeing right now is what are called streamlines, basically showing you how air is moving and wind speeds. And so this helps you identify large scale wind patterns. It can also help you identify storm systems. For example, this little guy down here this is Tropical Storm Bud. Um, I was actually writing this lecture at the time that there was a tropical storm that was forecast to weaken, but as it's weakening, it's going to travel north and hit Baja, Cal hit Baja California. So this is the current condition. This is the current state of this model. But what we can actually do is we can then begin to toggle to an hour from now, two hours from now, three hours from now, and so on, and look at how weather conditions are changing. And there's Bud right there, and look what it's doing. It's weakening. If you notice, the winds are, are dying down. They're not as intense. We're, we're kind of seeing a transition from, um, from reds to more oranges and yellows. That indicates weakening winds. But here it is, hitting the Baja California coastline. It's just made landfall. It's then forecast to move over the Gulf of California and then into the Mexican mainland. And at this point, what was today a tropical storm will be, by Saturday, a nothing, pretty much. It's, it's going to die out. Now let's see what actually happens in three days from now, what happens by Saturday. What's cool though is not only can you do this with one model, currently I'm doing it with the ECMWF, 
which has a nine kilometer resolution, meaning it splits the earth up into nine kilometer by nine kilometer boxes. But I can actually do this using different forecast models. So here's the GFS. The GFS model, and let's go back to BUD. So here's BUD again. Down here, the, the model looks a little bit different than the CMWF because it plugs those initial conditions in a little bit differently and it uses them differently. But look, it has a very similar forecast. The storm is weakening, it's traveling to the north, Baja California is getting hit. The winds look a little bit stronger for the, the, the GFS than the ECMWF, but here we go. And boom. The storm quickly hits and it actually dies out a lot quicker than it did in the ECMWF. So again, each one of these models, and then if you want to look at the NAM, you can do the same thing with the NAM. One of the uh, caveats with the NAM, however, is the NAM only goes out three days, at least on here, and it only does forecasts for the greater United States region. It's sort of our forecast model. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next lecture. So going back to what we were talking about here. So yeah, each model is different. But hey, if you want to access the output, there you have it. So let me talk about two real quick tools that we can use. And then the next lecture, I'm going to talk about human interaction with these with these forecasts and how we make weather forecasts and how we use that to analyze these models. So um, one of the tools we use is what's called an ensemble forecast. So think about what would happen if you went to a doctor and you, know, you were feeling something, you were feeling sick, you went to a doctor and the doctor said that you had 24 hours to live you'd probably freak out, but it's just one person's opinion, one data point, one individual. Would you really be confident that what they're saying is true? Well, if you're like me, you probably would want a second opinion. Well, ensemble, ensemble forecasts are basically a second opinion. So now let's say you jump in your car, you go to another doctor, and that doctor then says, yeah, you only have 24 hours to live. You might not want to spend more time looking at other doctors. You then go to a third doctor and you talk with them. Same thing. Fourth doctor, you talk to them. Same thing. With each doctor that agrees with that prognosis, you're going to become more and more confident that, yeah, you're probably going to die. You have 24 hours to live. And the way ensemble forecasts work is we take the weather model, we, so we take that model, but we tweak the initial conditions just a little bit. We change the initial temperature by a degree or two, or we change the wind by a degree or two, or we change the way that the model uses that initial condition slightly. But we make very small tweaks, and we then run the model multiple times. And we do this for all kinds of weather models. And then we analyze the output. The example I gave a few moments ago of, of going to four different doctors and getting you know, basically the same prognosis from all four doctors, chances are you're gonna trust it. You know, you're not gonna question it. It's not going to be anything that you're worried, or you're, well, you're worried about it, but it's not gonna be something that, that you have doubt. The more doctors you talk to, the more that give you that prognosis, the more confident you're going to be that it's the actual prognosis. Well, we have a name for that when we talk about ensemble forecasts. If all of the ensembles come out and they say, yeah, this is going to happen, they all predict the same thing, that's what we call a high confidence forecast. On the other hand, think about if you went to a doctor, so let's say you had a cold or you were feeling like you were feeling sick, you went to a doctor, and the first doctor says, well, you have 24 hours to live. You have some kind of 
deadly incurable condition, you know, 24 hours to live, you're going to die. Um, and you're not so sure that that's right, so you then go to another doctor. That doctor does a thorough examination and then just comes out and says, oh, it's just allergies, here's some Claritin. Now you have one doctor saying one thing, another doctor saying something completely different. You then go to a third doctor, and the third doctor comes out and says, okay, um, you have a condition that can be cured by surgery, um, but you're going to be fine. Um, and, and so now you have a third opinion that differs from the first two. One person says you're going to die. One person says you just need Claritin. Another person says you need a surgery. Well, what's actually going on? Are you confident in any of those answers? You now have three different answers and from three different medical professionals. It could be any one of those three. So what do you believe? That's what's called a low confidence forecast. In that case, each of the model runs has very different results. And so in that case, the confidence is very low. Let me give a few examples of high confidence forecasting and low confidence forecasting. So here's a high confidence forecast. So this was um, in October of 2012. And this was Hurricane Sandy. So you actually watched a documentary on this for your last module, um, if you're in my online class. And if you didn't see that, you know, check it out. It's called Inside the Megastorm. Um, and basically what happened was there was a hurricane named Sandy that was off the eastern seaboard of the United States. And usually most, or usually most hurricanes travel north, then northeast, and then blow out to sea. However, all of the forecast models, with the exception of these two here, had some kind of major westward turn that the hurricane was going to make. Seeing as almost all of the models predicted this, and most of the models actually agreed on a pretty relatively small distance from which this was going to happen, this is what we call a high confidence forecast. Now, can we pinpoint exactly where it's gonna hit? No. Um, if we took the mean of all of these ensembles, we could get a, a, a prediction that's gonna look something like this. It travels up, it makes its turn. Almost looks like it's going to hit New York dead on. Um, it actually ended up hitting Atlantic City, which isn't too far away. Um, but this was a high confidence forecast. We knew Okay, almost all the models say this is going to happen. On the other hand, here's a low confidence forecast over here. So this is the 850 millibar temperatures for Portland. And initially, all of the models are in pretty good agreement with one another. But the further out you go, the more all over the place they are. And the more disagreement they are in with each other. And so in this case, we really aren't able to make an accurate forecast because we have models basically telling us all kinds of different things. Um, if you take a look, one model in this case is predicting an 850 millibar temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. That's almost 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Another model for the same time period, for the same date, is predicting a, a temperature, so for practically the same time, a temperature below 5 degrees Celsius. So now this is a temperature around 30 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so two very different stories. Can we accurately predict which one is likely going to be the case? Well, there's a lot of noise here, and so the more noise there is, the more all over the place these results are, the less confident we can be in our forecast. Again, you have one doctor up here saying you're gonna die. You have another doctor down here that says you're gonna need Claritin and you're gonna be fine. And then doctors all over the place. So that's a low confidence forecast. The last tool I'll talk about, so ensemble forecasting is really important because 
the more on board these models are with each other, the more confident we can be in the forecast. But sometimes you don't want to see a large scale across the entire country forecast. Sometimes just looking at one location is good enough. And so you can do that using what's called model output statistics. And these are available from the National Weather Service and they display progs for a single location. So rather than looking at a prog for the entire United States, you can just look at a prog for one location. In this case, I picked San Jose Airport. And this prog then shows you a bunch of different things. So this prog shows you time, temperature, dew point, cloud cover, wind direction. Uh, this is based on a 360 degree compass. So 30 represents uh, 300 degrees. That's pretty much west-northwest, maybe a little bit more northwest with a wind speed of nine knots. And then it can predict things like what kind of precipitation you might get, how much precipitation, um, what are the probabilities for precipitation, um, what the ceiling is, what kind of visibility there's going to be. And it can display these progs for every three hours. So rather than looking at one 24 hour prog for the entire country, you can look at a series of progs for one location. And you can actually do that for different models. This model up here is the GFS. This one down here is the NAM. And then if you take a look, you can look at high temperature, low temperature, um, again, the presence of precipitation, ceilings, and the more in agreement these models are with each other, the more likely that forecast is to verify, to be accurate, the higher confidence you can have in it. With that said, there's a lot of errors that these models have. 